Tonight we'll be addressing science and particularly discussing Are you physics. Okay with that? Now this, quest, this topic is fascinating in and of itself, um, but it's also the sort of topic that raises further questions, big questions, like where did the universe come from? Are we alone? What does modern physics tell us about whether there's a God? My name is Rebecca Paulos. Um, I did my undergraduate degree here at UTS, um, studying biotechnology and accounting. Uh, so I'm not a physicist, I actually work in cancer science. Um, and I'll be emceeing tonight's debate. So the position that our invited speakers will be debating is the question um, of whether the evidence of astrophysics indicates that the universe has a designer. Uh, so you can see the debate uh, proposition here. And what I'd like to ask you to do is to take out your phones and go to a website um, just on the screen <laughs> where we would like to hear your thoughts before the debate. Um, so if you go to this website, we'll actually have some of your responses coming up on the screen um, as you fill it out. So I'll just give you a moment to do that now. Say no, and 17% are undecided. So uh, let's press on with tonight, and we'll see kind of what the result is afterwards. So uh, debating for the affirmative side, um, saying that evidence of astrophysics does indicate that the universe has a designer. Uh, we have Reverend Michael Paget um, and Dr. Luke Barnes on the end. And debating for the negative, we have Ian Brass. Um, and Dr. Peter Slezak. So I'll be introducing each speaker just before they come up uh, to present and you'll find out a little bit more about them. But just briefly, the format for tonight's debate. Um, each speaker will have 15 minutes to present their case to us. We'll start with the affirmative and then back to the negative and again. And then we'll take a very short five minute break just for you to stretch your legs, grab some water at the back. Um, and Clear your mind before we get back into it for another 20 minutes or so of open discussion between the speakers, and then we'll finish with 15 minutes of questions from you, the audience. So if you've got any questions, make a mental note of them to ask them at the end. Um, but without further ado, I will invite in just a moment um, Mike Paget up, um, but just to introduce him. Uh, Mike Paget is the Senior Minister at St Barnabas Anglican Church, Broadway, and the Anglican Chaplain to both UTS and the University of Sydney. Mike has degrees in education, physics and theology, doesn't get to surf nearly, nearly enough, and loves helping people explore the big questions of life. So please welcome up Mike Padgett. That edge is going to be dangerous all night. Evening, my name is Mike. Uh, as Ben is introducing me, I'm the Senior Minister of Barney, who's just down the road. I'm really delighted that you've joined us here tonight, and I hope we're going to keep you thoroughly engaged this evening. You may have already noticed that this panel here is super multidisciplinary. Uh, Ian Bryce is an engineer, Peter Slezak is a philosopher, Luke Barnes an astrophysicist and a cosmologist, and I'm the amateur in the crowd. I do have a degree in physics, uh, but I'm a lowly pastor and a theologian. But I'm glad to be with you here tonight, and I've really loved preparing for this because the evidence uh, of science was actually a really significant factor in me leaving behind the atheism that I was raised in and directing me towards the exploration of the claims of Christianity. My hope for you tonight is that something of my personal journey might end up actually making good sense to you and that some of you might even consider making that journey yourself. You notice that I'm actually setting a really low bar for Luke and I this evening. We don't actually have any great grand vision of what we're going to achieve. We certainly don't think that we're going to box anyone into a corner or prove without a doubt the existence of the divine. Our goal is much simpler. We hope to persuade you that the most up-to-date cosmological theory and data available can reasonably be argued to produce an openness to the idea of a mind behind the universe. But I want to begin 
by asking a fairly obvious question to set this whole conversation on a sound footing. When we say universe, what do we mean? What actually is our universe like? I don't know what quality of public education or private education you may have had coming to university, but you may have picked up along the way that the universe is infinite, infinite in extent, infinite in time, with an infinite number of mass points, and therefore a universe in which nothing is improbable. And that was certainly the universe of Sir Isaac Newton. But it's not at all the universe that we accept today. Our observable universe is, due to expansion, about 46 billion light years in radius. It has 10 to the 80 protons worth of matter, and for those of you in the humanities, that's a lot. Roughly the same amount of electrons, about a seventh of the number of neutrons, as well as lots of what cosmologists have come to call dark energy, which is what drives the acceleration and the expansion of the universe. There are four fundamental forces, the strong nuclear, the weak nuclear force, electromagnetic force, and of course gravitational force. And the interaction of these various fundamental forces leads to everything that you see that is physical. Not, however, I'd love to argue, human freedom or rational decisions or love, but that's a topic for another day. Anyway, all this we know from science. The question before us today is whether science tells us anything about the transcendent, anything about God. We need to be very careful here, because science is always open to further investigation and discovery. The scientific theories develop uh, so that any one thing that either side, if you want to call sides in a conversation like this, points to tonight, might be significantly modified within the decade. One of the things I'll be talking about fairly soon is just how much the data has changed in recent years and how solidly it points in a certain direction. What science can do, though, is tell us about something of a convergence of evidence, you know, a, a set of clues each of which could have an unlikely but a naturalistic explanation, but which together move us towards a single strong probative sense of what we might want to discuss. And I'm going to speak to one of these clues tonight, which is that there is good reason to believe that once there was nothing, but now there is something. And then Luke is going to pull on his astrophysics hat and talk about the nature of that something, which is another clue. Uh, these are just two clues. I want to suggest that uh, anything as big as a cosmology or a worldview or a metaphysics uh, shouldn't actually rest upon just one or two pieces of argument. It's a, uh, a picture that you draw out of hundreds and thousands of observations and pieces of data, but this is where we'll start with. So firstly, nothing. Nothing comes from nothing. At this point, it seems fairly clear <coughs> that physics is coming very close to proving an absolute beginning of physical reality itself. Whether that physical reality is simply our universe, or perhaps a multiverse, or a universe in the high dimensional space of string theory, or a static quantum cosmological state, Science seems to be moving in a fairly conclusive direction, that there is a beginning. And this whole idea really has its origin with the Big Bang Theory developed by the early 20th century Belgian Catholic priest and astronomer, Georges Lemaitre, which proposes that the universe has expanded from a primordial, dense, initial condition at some time in the past, uh, currently estimated to be approximately 13.8 billion years ago, give or take 100 million years and continues to expand to this day. The, the first real evidence for a singularity was discovered in the 70s by Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, the um, not as famous as Stephen Hawking amongst most people, but world famous in his space, English mathematician and physicist who actually later corrected some of the theories of his friend and colleague to allow for inflation. Some of the most conclusive evidence that the universe that any universe, in fact, must have a beginning, came as late as 2003 from three leading cosmologists, uh, Arvind Bohr, Alan Guth, and Alexander Belenkin. 
that it's often called the BVG theorem, who are able to prove that the universe, uh, that any universe, I should say, which has on average been expanding throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. Now, it could be. It could be that there is an endless regression of discrete universes, but as Professor John Polkinghorn, the quantum theorist, argues, we need to recognise these kinds of speculations for what they are. Right? The infinite universes theorem, or hypothesis, I should say, is not physics, he says, but in the stricter sense, metaphysics. You know, there is no purely scientific reason to believe in an ensemble of universes. By construction, these other worlds are unknowable to us. A possible explanation of equal intellectual respectability, and to my mind, greater economy and elegance, would be that this one world is the way it is because it is the creation of the will of a creator who purposes that it should be so. The idea that the universe has a beginning also makes sense of our observations of entropy. The entropy measures the degree of disorder of a system. So the floor of my daughter's bedroom has a high level of entropy. And basically, uh, entropy is about the degree to which an energy gradient is flat, right? So systems left to their own devices tend to keep this level of disorganisation pretty constant or to increase it. That's the second law of thermodynamics. To make a system more organised takes something coming from outside the system and expending energy to exhaust to to, uh, to organise it. Right? Again, a parental illustration I do here, but I'll spare you. Um, I can make a cup of coffee hotter than its surroundings, for example, but I need to invest, inject energy from outside that system. You following me so far? Right? That's what entropy is about. This is why perpetual motion machines are impossible. Because they run down. For a physical system to do work, okay, it needs to be in the state of disequilibrium, of an unequal distribution of energy. If a universe has been around forever, then it must be in a state of maximum equilibrium. It's run to disorder. The energy has all evened out. And such an energy couldn't do work, it couldn't change things, and yet, that's not what we see. That kind of universe would be a dead universe, everything the same, and yet, in our universe, there are hot stars and there are cold spaces. There's galactic, clus galactic clusters, and there are empty spaces. And there are physical systems constantly working on matter, stars burning and so on. And so entropy itself indicates that the universe has not been around forever. It had a beginning. There was something, and before that, there was nothing. And from nothing, nothing comes. Now, some very eminent physicists and theorists have tried to work a way, a way around this. So Stephen Hawking, for example, suggested that all he needed was the law of gravitation and M-theory. That's just as an interesting aside. Isaac Newton and Stephen Hawking both held the same chair at Cambridge University. And Isaac Newton used the law of gravity as evidence for the existence of God. Hawking has used it since as an evidence against the existence of God. Just an interesting point. Two brilliant men, two very different conclusions. Lawrence Krauss, Krauss has argued that all he needs is quantum theory and vacuum states. Even Blenkin, one of the researchers who in 2003, as I mentioned, demonstrated the finitude of universes. He suggested that maybe a universe could tunnel into existence, but you just have to give him quantum laws. Now, I get that when we talk about nothing, we usually have something very particular in mind. We usually think about physical stuff and so on. But the nature of uh, nothing has radically changed due to the advances of science. Our understanding that what we once thought was nothing is actually an incredibly complex, energy-rich set of vacuum states. It means that what we once thought was boring old nothing is actually very much something. 
As a Columbia University philosopher, uh, philosopher and theoretical physicist, David Orbit writes, vacuum states, no less than giraffes or refrigerators or solar systems, are particular arrangements of elementary physical stuff. The fact that particles can pop in and out of existence over, kind as, over time as those quantum fields rearrange themselves is not a whit more mysterious than the fact that fists can pop in and out of existence over time as my fingers rearrange themselves. And none of these poppings, if you look at them aright, amount to anything even remotely in the neighbourhood of a creation from nothing. Science has been moving in this direction to understand that at some point in the past there was nothing and then there was something. And in 2012, the New Scientist magazine reported somewhat embarrassingly that at the meeting of a group of great minds to honour Stephen Hawking's 70th birthday, two proposals were presented that posed serious threats to our existing understanding of the cosmos. One shows that a problematic object called a naked singularity is a lot more likely to exist than previously assumed. And the other, and I quote, suggests that the universe is not eternal resurrecting the thorny question of how to kickstart the cosmos without the hand of a supernatural creator. So, there is, according to the latest physics, an extremely high likelihood of a beginning to physical reality, prior to which physical reality, there was literally nothing. Secondly, I think we can receive as an a priori commitment that from nothing, only nothing comes. And therefore, it is highly likely that the universe came from something, a something that is not physical reality, it is beyond physical reality, and sufficiently powerful, whatever it might be, in order to initiate reality, which is commonly referred to as a transcendent cause of the universe, or in short, a creator. I think I'm with Werner Heisenberg on this. When he says, the first gulp from the glass of natural scientists may turn you into an atheist, but at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let me now introduce uh, our first speaker for the negative, um, who is Ian Bryce. Uh, so Ian Bryce graduated in physics and engineering and has taught aerospace at UNSW and UTS. In his retirement, he teaches a course called Physics and the Big Questions. Vice President of the Secular Party of Australia, he has been described as a militant and rabid atheist. Please welcome Ian. Rebecca. Rob, might we turn that computer around so I can see what my slides are? Or maybe you can start my slide show. Okay, all right. Well, the, the topic that I'm addressing here, a summary of it is that, that the evidence of astrophysics indicates the universe has a designer. So it's very important. It's good to see so many people qualified in physics as well as philosophy here tonight. That makes a change. Well, I think that cartoon probably sums up the uh, question. Here we see that God has lit a big firework called Big Bang. It says, "Light fuse and stand clear." And God's running away with his hand over his hands over his ears. So I think that summarises the question: Was there a designer who perhaps kicked off the universe? Now, some of you might know the physicists might recognise that there's a problem with this picture because where did God run to? Everywhere he could run to is in this universe, and the Big Bang filled this entire universe, so <laughs> perhaps there's a problem there. Okay, now I see four alternatives about there being a designer for the universe. The firstly, there is a designer, and he is the Christian God, as described in Genesis. Now I know this, uh, tonight's run by Credo, which uh, certainly uh, believe very much in Genesis and the, the Christian religion. And so that's one possibility. Another one is that there is a designer, 
dealing as a designer who's not a traditional god, who set the um, process and set the process in motion and guides it from time to time. That's another one, intervention, interventionist des designer. See, there was a designer who set off the process and has never intervened since. So that's another possibility. And finally, that there is no designer and the universe came through natural, came to be through natural process. So as I, as I see it, there are the four possibilities and I'm going to address each of those with a couple of points of evidence. Okay, that there is a designer and he's the Christian God. What is the Christian God? The Bible describes Jesus healing people, for example, one piece of evidence. A quote from the Credo website, Jesus displays displayed power over disease. What does, what does an astrophysicist make of this? Well, here's an astrophysicist. You might recognize Stephen Hawking. And this cartoon shows a discussion between Stephen Hawking and God. So Stephen Hawking says, as he said many times, there is no God. And God says, smite him. Now, smite him is a great biblical word. I'm not quite sure what it means, but I wouldn't want to be smitten. And God's assistant, God's assistant says, but sir, you already smoked the shit out of him. There's nothing left to smite. You can only move his eyelids. In fact, you might do more to prove your existence if you healed him. Now, that would be really cool. So Hawking waits, nothing happens, Hawking waits, nothing happens, and Hawking concludes there is no God. <laughs> so perhaps, perhaps if there was a God and he was capable of healing people and he cared, he could easily cure Hawking and prove his existence. So, has God healed anyone? If you visit Lourdes in France, you'll find out that there's a cave full of discarded crutches from people who have been healed. Except they haven't. It's all a fake. The Christian... The Catholic Church has tried to prove that God has healed a lot of people and they've, the best they can come up with a few cases that amounts to one in three million that were possibly healed at Lourdes. And in fact, they don't even stand up to science. So I, I myself had cataracts and couldn't see very well for a while, so I had science put in some plastic lenses in my eyes and that worked 100%. So if you want to be healed, you should turn to science. Certainly not a God. You can also ask what sort of designer would put lenses in people's eyes that degrade in about 50 years. So another piece of evidence. Okay, so if you're studying medicine at UTS, how many of you are students at UTS? Put your hand up if you are. Okay, if you're studying medicine, you will be handicapped in your studies if you believe there's a God who intervenes and can heal things when it's totally contradicted by all of medicine. Okay, next piece of evidence. The Christian God, the, the central pillar, is that a woman was made pregnant by a ghost and gave birth to Jesus. What does science make of that? They say Jesus was fully human. Well, science tells us that a human male needs a Y chromosome. So he couldn't have got one from Mary. Did he get one from the ghost? That doesn't make any sense, does it? So if you're studying biology at UTS, you'll be greatly hindered in your studies if you believe in a Christian God. In fact, all religions claim that theirs is the one true God. To quote the Credo website, any other God that people choose to worship is, in reality, something they have created or dreamt up for themselves. That sounds fair and reasonable, doesn't it? Except why, why do they claim it doesn't apply to their God? And it does to everyone else. You can see there, there's a whole zoo full of gods there that have existed. At least a thousand gods have existed throughout history or claim to exist. And if you believe one is any more real than the others, then you're in a bit of trouble. Okay, the second position is there's a designer, not a traditional God, who set off the process and guides it from time to time. Maybe that's a better possibility. Well, as uh, we heard before, the, there are four forces in nature, the strong nuclear, the weak nuclear, gravitation and electromagnetism, and they're very well understood by physics to such an extent that, the, that um, there are no gaps through which a God could intervene in this universe. If there was, it would show up in exceptions to these rules. And instruments like the Large Hadron Collider are looking for exceptions to these rules, and they haven't found any. At least in the here and now, here meaning the observable universe, and now meaning since the end of the inflation period at 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So here and now is pretty broad. 
So there are no gaps in physics by which a God intervenes in the world. So that's, that possibility is thrown out also. Next one. There was a designer who set off the process and has never intervened since. Maybe that's a better possibility. So let's look at that. Astrophysics has shown that the universe is about 13, it is very old, about 13 billion years old. And God first revealed himself to mankind about 2,000 years ago. So the question is, what did God do for the intervening 12.999998 billion years? Perhaps he played ping pong with the ball connected, connected to his back. So I think that's the ultimate definition of boredom. Or perhaps this cartoon, the first tweet ever, so God tweeted to the world, just created the world, nothing going on now, bored. So perhaps that's what God did. Now, I've participated in quite a few debates with people who believe in God, in fact, often with scientists who claim to believe in God, and I've asked them the question, what did God do for the first 12.999 billion years? And here are some of the answers I've got. God was enjoying himself during that period. Okay? God was planning what was to come. That came from the most reverend Archbishop Peter Jensen, top Anglican of New South Wales. And someone else said, God was administering to the dinosaurs. Well, even the dinosaurs weren't around until quite recently on the scale of the universe. So I think you'll see here that some of the best ways to address these claims is by a bit of humour, which shows that it was true light. Okay, another question we can ask is, where is the designer now? If there wasn't, was a designer or is a designer, where are they now? You can look through the universe with telescopes searching for the designer. No one's found him or her. So physics tells us that everything that happens in the universe is located in space and time. Now you've all heard of the Cartesian coordinates. Any scientists or engineering students here? Oh, great. That's good, quite a few. Who's heard of Cartesian coordinates? Everyone has. Well, in physics these days, you combine that with time, or to be more accurate, the speed of light times time, and you get a, a four vector, CT and XYZ, or ICT. And that gives you the four vector, uh, defines every event that occurs in this universe. For example, a traditional mind ex thought experiment that physicists give is a flashbulb going off, and that can be described as the X, Y, and Z coordinates and the time it goes off. Goes off. So everything that happens in the universe has a four vector. So therefore, if there's a creator in the universe, they must be located according to a four vector, and we must be able to find them somewhere in the universe. And the most basic events in the universe, according to Richard Feynman, are interaction, interactions of particles and bosons. Has anyone seen a Feynman diagram that looks a bit like that? In this case, we have a, <laughs> we have a particle on the left and the particle on the right interact, interacting by a wavy line which represents a photon or, or other boson. Now if the, that means that there is a designer who affects this universe or affected this universe, they must be in this universe. You can't have a, a, have a designer who's outside the universe affecting this universe because the Feynman diagram must somehow pop into existence without originating in this universe. So everything that happens in this universe according to the best physics was caused by something in this universe. So I'm sorry, but designers are out. Okay, a designer would have nowhere to hide. I'm sorry if there was one. Okay, so if you're studying astrophysics at UTS, again, if you believe there's a designer for the universe, you'll be handicapped in your studies and you'll be very confused. Not a good idea. Okay, so there's fourth possibility. There is no designer. The universe came about through natural processes. Well, all evidence supports that. All evidence supports that. And any science textbook at UTS will support that. And any Wiki, Wikipedia en entry on physics or science will also support that. And a third reference is my series of lectures called Physics and the Big Questions that I've developed in my retirement from university to, to make people aware of 
how physics works at a fundamental level. Okay. Some people claim that it is impossible to really <coughs> live out the belief that there is no God. That's a quote from the Credo website. Well, hello, here I am. <laughs> I believe there's no God. Along with all other atheists, humanists, skeptics and rationalists in Australia. Each of those has a separate society. And the religion beliefs, in, in, according to this 2016 census, showed that 31% of Australians have no religion and 26% are Catholic and all other sects are less true, less, less of you. So it's impossible for people to live out their life with a belief without a God, while well, the most majority of people do compared to other sects. I'm sorry. Can a scientist believe in God? A religion and science com compatible beliefs? I'd like to give you some statistics. These graphs show belief in a personal God on a world basis versus the level of education. And as you can see there, belief in religion has to decrease as you get more and more education. Always decreases. Because the more you know about the real world, the less room there is for a God. So I know there have been people who claim to be physicists and, and believe in God, like John Paul King Vaughan and John Lennox, um, but they they can't really be both. You've only got room for a God if there's something wrong with your understanding of physics. It's quite clear. The second set of evidence, this comes from the USA, where there's greater freedom of speech than the, the world of many countries in the world. And that shows that non-belief in, increases very dramatically with education in science. So you can see there on the left, non-college USA education, college graduates, and the National Academy of Science members. And the higher you rise in science, your non-religion rises and rises. And it's clear that if you knew all about the universe, it would reach 100%. So it's, so it's apparently impossible to know how the universe works and believe in a designer. Finally, this is religious belief among greater US scientists, called greater scientists in the USA. And over the decades from 1914 to 1998, there's a steady increase in disbelief so the more, the more science tells us about the world, the less room there is for a God. So, science and religion are clearly incompatible. The more one learns about the real world, the less one can believe in a God or a designer. And reliable information usually comes from experts, and those who know about the universe know there aren't any gods or designers. And finally, is the universe fine-tuned? This book by Victor Stenger goes into that in a lot of detail. He was a professor of physics. And he finds that he addresses the question, are the physical constants in the universe carefully selected from an habitable, for a habitable universe, such as you would expect if there was a designer? Well, no, they're not. If you, allow, if you vary one constant at a time, you find that they appear to be narrowly selected. But if you look at all of them, over time, you can find many combinations that could give a livable universe. So no, it's not fine-tuned. So if you want to wonder, if you wonder at the splendor of the universe, you should see the results from science, not from a designer. Thank you. He'll be speaking um, for the affirmative. Uh, so, Dr. Luke Barnes is an astrophysicist and cosmologist at Western Sydney University. He completed his undergraduate studies at the University.